welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. The goal of this show is to listen on conversations with agile thinkers that are really giving you tools and perceptions so that you can have a better life or that you can figure out how to make better decisions when you find yourself in a fork in the road, which we do almost every day or multiple times a day in this world that has unprecedented conflict and confusion. Who do we believe? So on the show today, I'm excited to have Jim Hernser. He is a pharmacist that owns one of the best compounding pharmacies in the United States, in my opinion, called Las Colinas Pharmacy in Dallas, Texas. I've met Jim because we've lectured together at quite a number of conferences, and he's one of those gentlemen that really shines from the inside out because he's got smart plus heart. Which, by the way, if you love these kind of conversations, don't forget that I have started an online membership called exactly that, Smart Plus Heart. And you can look into it at drlindsayberkson.com forward slash membership. We try to give people lots and lots of tools on the level of practitioners as well as just smart human beings. So Jim is in Dallas and he's on the show, and we're going to be talking about hormones, health, integrative medicine, and the threat to our ability to maintain that and what we can do about that. So welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And and by the way, I'm a member. (laughs) I'm a paying member (laughs) because what you have to say is not something you can find anywhere else. And so you're so valuable. And I'm not sure, I'm getting chilled up just thinking about it. I'm not sure your listeners realize what a treasure you are. Uh, Why do you say that? That's really sweet of you, but why do you, I I didn't expect the show to start this way, but why are you saying that? Honestly, the the way that you research and are always looking uh, beyond what we normally know, we we know, because we know certain things and not everybody is willing to expand that because they, okay, I'm good at this. I'm going to keep on doing this. Whereas you don't let that be a boundary for you. You continue to broaden your thinking and uh, that broad thinking makes you so valuable to your patients and to your listeners because they're getting uh, benefit from something that, that I'm not sure that they're going to find elsewhere. So yay, I'm big, big bow pat on the back for you. Oh, gosh, I really appreciate that. So we've known each other, I think, about maybe 15 years now or something like that. We've been wow, lecturing yeah. at different conferences. <laughs> well, I, was, I was admiring you before I knew you. So. Oh, come on, <laughs> Willie. So let's yeah. focus on you. Let's focus on you. How long have you had the pharmacy? And can you tell us a little bit about your journey of the pharmacy and your journey in your career, what a compounding pharmacist is, and your journey and your service with your community in Dallas and the surrounding Texas, um, because many people use you all throughout the state? Sure. We actually um, started the pharmacy in 1984 and, you know, just a corner drugstore and and uh, not long after, unfortunately, uh, my wife had some gynecological problems, very significant, and of course, surgery, uh, surg- surgical induced menopause. And so here, 28 year old woman is menopausal, and uh, and all of a sudden, everything changed. I watched her immune system just crash and burn. I watched her become inflammatory. Her her photographic memory just disappeared. Um, I saw her ability to handle stress, you know, go down, uh, mood flatten. And, you know, it was, wasn't was her. And I was thinking, what is wrong with my girl? And, of course, the doctors, you know, traditional doctors said, oh, we'll give her some Premarin, you know, pregnant marriage or an estrogen, and she'll be fine. Well, she wasn't. And so based on that, I, uh, I did research and I thought, because I didn't know a lot about hormones at the time. I was just a young kid, you know, barely uh, out of school. So I uh, came up with the idea, why don't we do a transdermal estradiol gel? So I made it happen I in, basically invented it. And it was the very first uh, transdermal. Uh, so estrogen. we're talking to the gentleman who really put the first topical estrogen replacement on the map. So understand that these are agile thinkers because people say we have a problem. Let's come up with a novel solution. That's huge. And, and all of a sudden, uh, 
my girls started coming back, you know, and then of course our, our knowledge about hormones uh, has way evolved since then. You know, I thought estradiol was everything. Well, you know, then we found out about estriol and we found out about estrone and we found out about progesterone and testosterone and DHEA and, and the benefits for women. And then of course we can talk about men as well for hormone balance. So it's all about balancing, keeping the hormones balanced, and uh, in maintaining a, a wonderful, successful patient outcome, they not only feel better, but they have better health. And, and those health markers are amazing. And to be honest with you, I don't know about you, Lindsay, but I run into it every day. There are barriers to women doing and men doing the right thing. They're scared because they have been fear mongered into believing that these hormones increase risk of breast cancer and heart disease and stroke and dementia. And they don't even talk about osteoporosis. And so we have to help these women and men be healthier. And, uh, and so we've got to alleviate those fears with science. And that is where you come in because you are the researcher of all researchers. And, uh, and, and of course I have spent a lot of time in that area as well, uh, researching, try to find out, what is real and what is bogus as far as these claims you hear? Oh, women, you know, the guy on TV says, women, if you are on estrogen and progesterone, you will have an increased risk of breast, of breast cancer, heart attack and stroke. And all he's doing is reading his teleprompter. You know, he is not truly understanding what those studies mean. And you and I can interpret those studies and we can say, here's what it really means. And the studies say that women will have a 20% decreased risk of breast cancer if they're using these hormones in a balanced fashion. And they're going to have decreased risk of dementia. Matter of fact, did you see the study the other day I sent you? Yes, from Arizona. This he, Talk about that a minute. This is, so, you know, the first study that, that whispered this was the Cache County studies because they took a few thousand people that didn't have dementia in their 50s and they followed them into the future to see who lost their wits and who didn't and what were the factors that played a role. And they discovered that women who had been on estrogen for at least 10 years had, depending on the study that was spun off of these gathering of the data, had a reduced incidence of Alzheimer's disease by 50%. And no one listened to that study. And then last week, talk about the Arizona study confirming the benefit of hormones on maintaining your brain. And I really thought that, because I don't know about you, but but I have a greater fear of losing my brain than anything. And right now right. at 65, I can Rightfully. tell you, I am sharper than I've been probably in any time in my life. And it, but, but I have been doing the right things. I know what to do. I know the tricks and, uh, and the keys. So um, bottom line is, is this study showed that there was a 78% decreased risk of dementia um, if you're using bioidentical hormones. 78%, almost 80% decreased risk of losing your cognitive ability. And only 50% if you're using traditional hormones. So there's benefit from using traditional hormones, but there's more benefit from using the bioidentical hormones. That is exactly right. That was a huge study, but it didn't make headline news. I know it. But yeah, isn't it interesting? Good news never makes headlines. Bad news does. It's sensational. And they and don't you know they love sensational stories? Um, just like the uh, the Women's Health Initiative study, that was a sensational story. Oh, women, you're going to have a 1.26, a 26 percent increased risk of breast of invasive breast cancer. They didn't just say breast cancer; they said invasive breast cancer if you're using hormones. Well, actually, the study they didn't say that's one woman in a thousand. She could have been eating Big Macs, you know, <laughs> had nothing to do with hormones. There was no causative effect from hormones. And, and the listeners uh, hopefully can appreciate this. There is something called biostatisticians, uh, um, people who take medical data and then translate in that into what is real. And unless it's a, a 100% increased risk, there is no increased risk. It's not even statistically significant. Just like the one woman in a thousand is nothing. That, that's a woman that maybe ate Big Macs her whole life. That's why she got breast cancer. So there's no, until you start getting the much higher risk factors there um, and relative risk, I should say, uh, then, then when you when you see a study that says it's only 26% increased risk, that's actually zero. And and as they follow that study on uh, up, up until last year, the nap. <laughs> 
<laughs> so this shows you the reality of the show. So, you know, women, 18 million women, the, the majority of women were on hormone replacement, most likely in the form of Premarin, which is horse's urine, conjugated equine estrogen, all the way up to the women's health initiative. The Women's Health Initiative was the first randomized set of trials to try and take a look if we really did get benefit from hormones. And they thought they were just going to prove the benefit. And then they stopped it prematurely. But within a few months, the reanalysis of it looked like it was bogus, that there wasn't this negative and negative um, risk of taking hormones, but only the scary headline news made stayed in the consciousness of physicians and patients. And the thing that really got me was in 2017, there there have been many reanalyses of the Women's Health Initiative because it got so many doctors to stop giving prescribing hormones and women became fearful of estrogen that it caused breast cancer. So that became the, the new cultural reality. And so many people have reanalyzed this because very early on, they saw that the statistics were really a fiasco. And in 2017, Hudis published a study where they reanalyzed everything and they showed that they forgot to control in the control group Mm -hmm. for the confounding variable if women had in their past ever been on estrogen. So the control group had a number of women in it that had been on estrogen. So they had a lower incidence of breast cancer because their breast tissue was protected from estrogen. And so that made the experimental group falsely look like it had more cases. So that was a huge methodologic flaw. That didn't make headline news. And and it was a it was a bias study. Um, the lead researcher had a, a a public bias against hormones, and he said, "I'm going to put the brakes on this hormone bandwagon," and and he he said that publicly. And then they they made him the head of this study, so it's already a biased study because who was, the, who was that gentleman? That was uh, Jacques Rousseau. He was a, a South African cardiologist. And he hated hormones. He had a personal bias Isn't against Isn't that hormones. weird that somebody can hate hormones that are a major physiologic signaling molecule? How could that be? I can't, I can't even understand it. So so anyway, he, he without even uh, consulting the other lead researchers, he released this to the lay media. You know, you never release the results of a study till it's been peer-reviewed by JAMA and North North. Uh, New England uh, Journal of Medicine, those kind of uh, journals will peer review it and say, you know what, this is valid or this is not valid. So those other researchers slowly over the years started saying, you know what, we got this wrong. Instead of saying he got it wrong, they they said we were part of this, we got it wrong. And women are actually seeing benefit from these hormones, not risks, increased benefits. And, you know, I don't know about you, Lindsay, but I do believe that, and they were using the very worst hormones you could possibly possibly use and saw benefits. They were using Premarin and and chemicalized progestin in the study. And I believe, and I truly believe this, and of course it's uh, experiential for me, and there's also studies to back it up, that when we use bioidentical hormones, I think that we give our our patients an even greater chance of protection from uh, breast cancer and heart disease and stroke and dementia and osteoporosis. Well, that huge French cohort study where they took a look at natural hormones versus not, they showed a protective effect of natural hormones on breast tissue. And in Europe, they often apply progesterone right to the breast, which we don't classically do here in the United States. You know what really got me? So here, every all women were using hormones and the promise was feminine forever. And then because the Women's Health Initiative was really a plan to investigate how to protect women as they age, 40 prestigious institutions got together and set up all these different studies looking at women every which way because we're an aging country. We're a very, we're, our country, we have more people who are getting older than people who are younger. And we wanted to figure out how do we not topple Medicare? So let's look at women every which way and figure out how to keep them healthy and keep the government and our money healthy. So they did many studies. They looked at bone health, they looked at brain health, and they looked at hormones to see if they were a tool to keep women healthier. So 40 institutions got together to do these two studies thinking that they were going to prove that hormones were effective, but the methodology was flawed. And within a few months, Leon Spiroff, 
He's like the dude. He's the guru. He's the the GYN guru. He's written the books, all the textbooks that OBGYN docs learned their board certification program from. He is the guy. Mm -hmm. Within a few months, Leon, who I look to, he's a professor. I'm not sure he's still teaching at the University of Oregon. So when I was going to school there, he was a professor at the same time. He's very smart and he's very influential and everyone looks up to him. Within a few months, he started pumping out papers saying, don't listen to the Women's Health Initiative. Listen to 40 years of clinical experience. Don't listen to this little attempt at a randomized study to look at women to protect the government and Medicare. I don't believe these statistics. He pumped out at least 15 papers within the first two years, reanalyzing it and saying it was a statistical fiasco, as I just said, and don't listen to this, but nobody listened to him, which is so crazy. I know, it just, it shocked me. And even the North American Menopause Society and the Endocrine Society came out and said, you know what, WHI, Women's Health Initiative Study, got it wrong. You know, women can be on hormones as long as they want to be on them and as long as they want to have good quality of life. And and uh, and they don't believe in necessarily the protection like we do, but they said it for, for quality of life. And if you know, if nothing else, use them for quality of life. But the great thing is, is that that barrier of fear should have been lifted, uh, that women should not fear hormones. And if they do, then they're they're really allowing their amygdala, which is the fear center in the brain, to override their prefrontal cortex, which is the executive reasoning that says all the studies, over 90% of studies say that you are going to have protection if you use these hormones in a balanced fashion, as Spiroff used to say. Uh, um, the, you have to, a woman can only be optimal if you have the uh, actions of a balanced hormone regimen, you know? So, so even he recognized that hormone balance is a key you know, Lindsay, and I, and I love that statement and I use it every day. Well, many of, so we have more and more people achieving centenarianship. More people are living to be a hundred. I hate to say this, but 80 doesn't, I was telling a girlfriend this morning, oh my God, 80 doesn't sound old to me anymore. <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> but that means that I'm a young old elder, right? So we are living longer. But how are you going to live longer? Are you going to be vibrant in your 70s, 80s, and 90s? Or are you going to be in a wheelchair with your head back, snoring, and having no cognitive capabilities? And what aging is, I think if you make it a recipe, aging is loss of hormones and increased inflammation. And if you could replace your hormones... And the horses that they ride in on, which are good nutrition and exercise, then you reduce inflammation. And even though you live longer, you have a quality of life where you get to enjoy those extra years rather than suffer through them. And it's interesting that I I know these tricks and I don't hurt. I mean, I'm 65 and I don't hurt. I just don't have aches and pains. It, and it's, I know that sounds crazy, but when you know the tricks, it's amazing how well you can overcome these obstacles that the majority of Americans are battling. Oh, I love that when you know the tricks. I mean, it's that statement, knowledge is power. You know, it's such a simple little, small little statement, but it is exactly la veracité. It is the truth. The better you have tools, and you need to have a bunch of tools because not always the same tools helps every single person. So the bigger your tool bag, the better your deal. And hormones are part, I mean, I would not be who I am today without having been on hormone replacement. And I say this, I I feel that compounding pharmacists are some of the true healers that we have, but your profession is so under attack because big pharma drive so much of what goes on in our country and they want to have all the dollars. And there is this fight over the rupees. I know there was a list that the lawyer that's in our um, protect our bioidentical hormone coalition. We have a lawyer, Tom, he sent out a list of everything the FDA just made illegal for compounding pharmacists to put into formulas that doctors want to order. It contained green tea, Aloe vera, turmeric. Uh, it was a, f- a special form of DHEA. I mean, 
why the heck would they do that except they want to start in 2004, the FDA said now they could put natural components in with pharmaceuticals. That that became legal. So now they want the right to put those things into their pharmaceuticals. Do you think that's what's going on? Actually, that's just part of it. Uh, the, the big picture here is that the FDA, and under, under pressure from Big Pharma, um, and they will deny this to, the, to their end, but the FDA has an uh, anti-compounding culture. And Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who is the outgoing uh, head of FDA, uh, spoke at a conference I was at in Houston. And he said, um, I've got to tell you people here that, that, uh, that there is an anti-compounding culture within the FDA, and we don't want to know uh, what you do. All we want to do is, is we, it was our goal to get rid of you. I mean, and, and there, he's just saying it out loud, okay? And and I don't the know the same that. way against chiropractic. They've shut that. They've ruined that profession, and um, it's sad to see. So I'm sorry to mean to interrupt you there. Oh, and all I was going to say is is that uh, they are it's, they're a, an enforcement agency. Their job is supposed to take this law that Congress passed and then enforce it. But instead, they're writing rules that are that they're not empowered to do so, um, and so they they're way overreaching with their power because you know who's going to call them down? I mean, you know, people on the hill are almost scared of the FDA, in spite of the fact that the Congress is the, are the ones who are supposed to be the bosses, and the FDA is supposed to be the policeman for them. And somehow this has gotten out of hand, and now you've got the fox watching the hen house, you know, and so FDA has is slowly chipping away that, you know, they pass regulation after regulation and we've intercepted internal emails from them that says that, okay, this is going to be another nail in the coffin of compounders. So they are truly trying to wipe out an entire profession because they just don't like us. And, uh, and it's not because we've hurt a lot of people, you know, there was one compounding pharmacy that was not really a company pharmacy. The one in New England, right? Yeah. There was a manufacturer who, who called themselves a company pharmacy. They were putting out 30,000 vials of injectables a week. That's a manufacturer. That's not a compounder. Okay. We're doing individual prescriptions for individual patients. Yeah. Explain what a compounder is for people that are listening. Just give a little bit of a definition here. We provide customized uh, medications for patients. So a doctor and a patient meet uh, the, they, think, okay, what does this patient need? Just, let's just say it's a hormone preparation. Okay. I want, I want this amount of estriol, this amount of estradiol, uh, this amount of testosterone, this amount of progesterone, compound that for this patient and do the estrogens transdermally, uh, topically and do the progesterone orally. And, uh, and so we compound that and we have incredible, incredible equipment. I mean, my scales alone, just to measure the the hormones are $5,000. I have a a machine that mixes the powders for the capsules. That's $20,000. In other words, I'm investing in technology to make sure that my patients have the absolute best compound that they could possibly have the safest and most effective, best quality. I, I buy the best quality chemicals, you know, and I buy them from FDA approved facilities and so we're doing a good job. And You're doing uh, personalized, individualized medicine. This is precision medicine. Precision. And, and the great thing is, as you said earlier, that every case, is, it, it, this is not cookie cutter. Every case should be treated as an individual case. Just because that formula works for one patient doesn't mean you should prescribe it for every single patient. And so that's what I love being. So you have to work with doctors who are thinkers. Because these doctors that order that pers- that order a prescriptive compounded medicine from you, they've evaluated that patient personally, and they've said, "Boy, you know, I think this patient would do better if they have this, this, and this." And so that's a thinking doctor, not a doctor who's just handing out, "Well, here's an an estradiol patch, and here's a hypertensive med." They're thinking how to make a recipe that's individualized for that patient. So then you end up attracting the doctors that still like to think and that have not so many patients in a day that they can take the delicious time to do that. And, I, and plus, I'm in the in the enviable position of doctors trusting what I do. They've seen my outcomes. They've seen my patients doing better than their patients who are using traditional medicine uh, in, in hormones, for instance. And so they'll say, Jim, 
okay, I've got this case. Would you evaluate it for me? Would you give me a treatment plan and, uh, and I'll send it to me and then I'll prescribe it. And, you know, and that's a, that's a great guy who's put his ego aside and said, okay, what does my patient, how will my patient do best? What will the outcome be positive if, if I allow um, Jim who, who has been doing this for years and years and I've only been uh, moderately exposed to it, maybe I can do a, maybe he can do a better job of helping me to get a successful patient outcome. So what are the kind of things that you normally see from, what are the prescriptions you normally fulfill in the cases and things that you do at your pharmacy? You know, I've, I've been asked that question a lot. And because we work with so many specialties, I mean, whether it's uh, inflammation or autoimmune disease or hormone imbalance, you know, it, 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 it's, there's so many things that we can do that we can help with. I mean, even nutrition. I mean, I, I was telling you a case before we got on about reversing adult onset diabetes and we did it in four months. You know, I mean, I mean not, not only just improved, that's with no medications, we reversed adult onset diabetes. I've reversed autoimmune diseases. You know, Can you talk how you've reversed adult set? So the patient you were telling me had a blood sugar of 300 and the doctor wanted to put them on regular medicines and you decided to take a different path. So what did you decide to do? And now you said their last blood sugar was 90. Yeah. Eight or something. I, I had a report. I got a text this morning. Uh, said, "Hey, by the way, Jim, it's working. Uh, my fasting blood sugar this morning was ninety-seven, and uh, and that is normal. I mean, matter of fact. And I said, well, what is it running uh, postprandial, which means two hours after a meal? And she said ninety-five to one hundred five. That's amazing. That is, that is perfect control. And, and, uh, and this person has already lost 20 pounds. Um, she says, I cannot believe how much better I feel because I didn't realize how bad I was feeling. Um, and, uh, and I'm not using any medications. You know, so what did you do? What did you recommend? Um, we, we actually went on in a, in a kind of an extreme paleo uh, eating style. And uh, that means grain-free because this patient is definitely allergic to glutens and some grains. So we went totally grain-free, which almost um, on a lot of patients does have a very high glycemic index. If you don't, if you're concerned about uh, glycemic index and insulin response. So we did that. We, uh, we have her on very clean proteins, all free range proteins, um, uh, vegetables, uh, organic vegetables, and that are non-starchy, you know, because we don't want that extra sugar in there um, using some berries as our fruit, because they seem to have the lowest glycemic index. Um, protein shakes. Uh, she does very well on bone broth protein, uh, which is partially digested. And uh, it's a beautiful protein, especially if it's a clean protein. From And a what good- company makes that? Um, Optimum Therapeutic Solutions is the one she's using, but Designs for Health makes a good one. Um, it's from very clean cows. You said Standard Process made one too, right? Uh, I, we also use uh, Standard Process, which is a wonderful company, natural company, they, and they have a, a powder that has lots of vegetables in it and uh, and a little bit of whey protein. But uh, anyway, we we put that together in a shake recipe for her, and she puts a green tea as her solution. She doesn't use milk or she doesn't use uh, other things in there. She uses green tea as her base. And then she adds- Which just, has been made illegal by the FDA for you to use in a compounding <laughs> prescription. But, it's okay but for you can put it in a blender. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, she, and she, we put a little, little bit of lemon juice. Uh, you know, I told her, I said that, that contributes to a little bit of acidity, which is actually good for body pH. And, uh, and I'll be darned if, uh, if she is just doing wonderfully with so this. three months from 300 blood sugar to 97 mm-hmm. blood sugar. So your health is malleable and the actions and the way that you live contribute to your outcome. And it's not always because you're pharmaceutically deficient. Often it's your choices. And the doctor of the future, or the doctor that I'm interested in is the doctor that will help me look at my choices so I can have some power in staying healthy. Those choices are exactly what we're talking about here. Um, Because shouldn't your doctor and your patients be allowed to make choices that they deem is best for you? And so if a compounded medication is the best, they should be allowed to prescribe that. And if a traditional medicine is best, they should be allowed to prescribe that. And so the doctors should be able to make those decisions and patients should have choice too, because I find that patients are very well informed. And if they are, if they come to me and ask me, can you please educate me? 
And so I do a lot of education. And so shouldn't they be allowed? There was a study uh, by uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine released uh, last year. That's where you testified. So we're going to want to talk about that. You you were one of the people that testified in front of that committee. But I'm sorry. They kept me on the hot seat for three hours. And, uh, and, And so they said that patients who wanted to use bioidentical hormones were not smart enough to decide what was best for their own health care. They said that. They also said that doctors who- Who's they? Say who they is again. This is National, National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine said, and it was a study commissioned by the FDA, so guess it was a little biased. All the members um, that were on the committee were all anti-compounding. And so it was not a scientific study, which is what NAS- uh, NASM should be. It should be a scientific study. Instead, it was a bias piece. And, and that's not science. Science is about investigating and coming up with the solutions that the science leads you to. Okay, what, what are the um, conclusions? So, And they concluded also that doctors who prescribe biological hormones for their patients were not smart enough to make good clinical decisions for their patients. I'm sorry, but, you know, we came to this dance. We were born, whether you believe in God or nature, whatever you believe in, we came to this dance with our bioidentical hormones. How could they not be the best for us? I just, and now we've got study after study after study. I presented a, a whole, up pages and pages of studies to these people, and they ignored them all. They said, we're not going to look at your studies, Jim. You know, we're going to look at our own studies. And they and the studies that they tried to base their decisions on didn't have anything to do with bioidentical hormone therapy like you and I practice, Lindsay. Uh, it was a crying shame, and it was a waste of two, $2 million. Wasn't there also one of the women on the committee that after, so the whole idea is that the FDA has said, we're not sure we're going to allow you to continue to compound bioidentical hormones. Mm -hmm. We're going to say they're so difficult to compound, you can't do it and you shouldn't have the legal right to do it. And your doctor shouldn't have the legal right to prescribe it. And we're going to make women only buy FDA backed commercial patented products. That's what the battle is all about. And the people who are making these patented commercial products. They were the ex-CEOs of Premarin and Prempro that got dissed from the Women's Health Initiative. They used to say bioidentical hormones were useless. It didn't matter. As soon as they their stock went down, they jumped into the bioidentical hormone waters. They started publishing articles. These are ex-CEOs of the Premarin and, and medroxyprogesterone acetate, Prempro, the progestin, the combo product. Now they started pumping out articles and peer review, hey, bioidenticals are better. Oops, we've got a product now from Therapeutics MD. And they went through phase one, two, and three, they're oral. And and they want the FDA to say, if you want a bioidentical product, use our bioidentical product, but compounding pharmacies don't have the right to do it. This is a huge battle. And, and again, it's about patient access, patient choice, uh, doctor choice, and it should be their choice. And I can't imagine that they are trying to wipe out an entire industry. Can you imagine, let's just say a doctor has malpractice, you know, and, and just not a good doctor. Does the FDA go in and, and Congress go in and say, you know what, let's just wipe out the profession of physicians. Let's just don't have any more. Anymore. And that's what this is about. It's, it's trying to wipe out an entire profession that is helping millions of people, 8 million people right now are using bioidentical compounded hormones, 8 million, okay? And that represents more than half of all of the men and women that are on hormones. And so- Wasn't there someone on this committee that was the committee listening to your testimony and Dr. Rosensweet's testimony and so forth that came up to you afterward privately and said, do I have this right that I want to, could, could you help me? I think I want to go on those bioidentical hormones. Matter of fact, she, she tested, she is a, she is one of the uh, doctors. She teaches in med school out in California, as well as, uh, um, you know, she's a gynecologist. And, uh, and so she was an expert testimony and she got up there and just slammed bioidentical hormones. And then after listening to me, you know, again, it was, I was on the hot seat for three hours. So they pumped me and pumped me and pumped me. Um, and, uh, and after she listened to me, she came up to me afterwards and she says, Jim, I am so sorry. And, you know, here she is, you know, she's about 60, she's attractive, but you, you can tell she's aging more rapidly than she needs to. And so she said, she said, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know what I didn't know. 
And she said, after listening to you, I actually want you to do my hormone case for me. And here she teaches in med school, gynecology. But she'd already she testified, that and that was now on the record. And off the record, she came up to you and said, boy, bioidentical hormones make sense to me, and I want to get on them myself. That is <laughs> sinful. That's wrong. That's wrong. But people wouldn't know that unless you're on the show explaining that that's a reality of what really happened. Because once she heard the story of bio, that is the deal. You don't know what you don't know, which is why we have this show, because once you know, then you've got a possible tool. So this is all about conversations to help you get in the know, and then you can make your own decisions. But look at this, this gynecologist on the record, dissed bioidentical hormones. Then once she heard your testimony of a few hours and Dr. Rosensweet's and other people's, Dr. Smith's, et cetera, then she came up to you privately and said, boy, that makes sense. Will you do my hormones? That's wrong. You know, and it, but it's just, it's the, it's what they're mired in. You know, and my, most of my friends are traditional doctors. Okay. And they're good guys and they, they want to help and they want to do the right thing, but they're just bound by this traditional medicine box. And, and this is where people like you are so valuable because you think more broadly, much more broadly, about what works for this patient uh, but it's evidence-based, it's science-based, as opposed to just being some uh, kid in a ball cap at GNC trying to sell you a vitamin, it is evidence-based. And so that's what I love about you is that is that it has to be evidence-based for you to start saying, this is the right way to go. And so, and that's what patients don't understand because they can just hear the, again, the, the teleprompter fed guy on TV saying, Hey women, if you're on hormones, a new study says you're going to get increased risk of breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. And so you don't know what to believe. That's the point that is happening on so many levels today is you don't know who to believe. And that's why we try to have people here that are science-based, but they also sound grounded and like somebody you would consider and ponder their words. So let's break down that study that came out of Arizona last week, because we used to be afraid of the big C cancer. And now rightfully so, if we're going to live longer, we're fearful of the other big C, which is cognitive decline. So what happened in Arizona in this study is they assessed 400,000 insurance cases they tracked people from insurance, actual people in insurance cases to see who got Alzheimer's disease and who didn't and look through their past medical records and what were the variables that contributed to cognitive decline or cognitive protection. And mind you, women on bioidentical hormones, the majority of those are not insurance reimbursed. So this was a bias study where they didn't include a lot of women on bioidentical hormones in their benefits or not, because this was just an insurance study. So they evaluated almost a half a million patients. And what they found is women who were on hormones had less Alzheimer's disease, and it was almost 60%. Their analysis showed that there was a 79% reduction of cognitive decline if you were on hormones. And it was more striking if you were on bioidentical hormones. There was, I forget what the 60% was about, but the bottom line was, is that hormones protect your brain. And when you think about that study, uh, you, you also think about the fact that, that even they recognized the fact that there was a benefit to bioidenticals over traditional, both were beneficial, but, right. but it was even, and what if they'd have included compounded bioidentical hormones, which are customized for each patient, that number, that 78% could have been 90%. Uh, and reduction. yet doctors say there's no cure. Gerontologists say, I went to a, a conference just a, uh, be right before the pandemic and there was a PhD in gerontology said there's no cure, no prevention for cognitive decline because hormones are not part of their consciousness or their curriculum. And so it is a crying shame that the FDA is doing everything in its power to remove the ability of patients to receive these compounded bioidentical hormones for men and women. And, uh, and so the, what people can do if they want to be proactive is can go to um, compounding.com website and you can put in testimonials. If you've been helped by these hormones, please go to compounding.com and write a testimonial because these testimonials are being shown to Congress, okay? The lawmakers are the ones who are going to make sure that we maintain access. And so we've got a, a campaign going on right now and just 
us little compounding community, we've already raised uh, one and a half million dollars and it's going to be a three year campaign and we're going to target lawmakers and their staff and we're going to target doctors so that the doctors understand what's at stake and also patient patient awareness in this podcast today is about patient awareness to know that there is a threat and and that all these wonderful things we're talking about hormones um, are going to go away you know if we don't act and so please you know i'm just asking as, as the one thing i'm asking today is it is it the listeners please act and go to that compounding.com and put in your testimony and if you want to if you feel uh, motivated you know contribute a couple of dollars to the campaign because it helps us because i mean i've contributed a ton of money to this trying to maintain patient access can you also talk about men because um Men miss out on hormone replacement too, and it's so important for them. And they're told that testosterone will harm their heart and will increase their risk of prostate cancer. And if they're diagnosed with prostate cancer, they have to get off testosterone if they're on it because it'll make it worse. And many of these are myths. Can you discuss this, please? Two different studies. One out of the uh, University of Texas Med School here in Texas. Another is out of uh, uh, Europe. And these the European study was 83,000 men. Uh, the University of Texas Med School study was 47,000 men. And both of them had the exact same conclusion that men on testosterone or with strong testosterone levels naturally had a reduced risk of cardiovascular events. Even men with brittle heart disease had reduced risk over men who were not using testosterone or had low testosterone levels. So just to show you that that when you hear that, oh, if, uh, you hear, hear some lawyer on TV, you know, if you've had a heart attack and you're on testosterone, you're going to be in a class action lawsuit. There's no scientific basis for that. It was a horrible study done in the VA, and the, it was another biased study that-, that Right, that uh, was definitely proven to be inaccurate. Inaccurate, and the FDA still uses that as one of its references, uh, and then just goes, wait a second, there's no science behind that study. And uh, and so also, uh, men should understand that that when you use testosterone therapy, you are not- increasing your risk of prostate cancer, you're reducing your risk of prostate cancer. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Abraham Morgan Taylor, who's a Harvard urologist, uh, looked at all the studies out there and said, you know what? Because we always assumed that testosterone would increase, would be like throwing gasoline on a fire of prostate cancer. And it turns out that it actually reduces the risk. And matter of fact, he even found that women, uh, men, excuse me, who were on testosterone when they had prostate cancer, it grew more slowly. It slowed the growth of prostate cancer. But what we also found in studies is that men who have good testosterone levels have less adult adult onset diabetes because it lowers blood sugar by as much as 20%, you know, which is a huge number. Um, It also lowers the risk of early cardiac uh, events and death. And, and these guys have less dementia. They have less pain, um, and less inflammation. Testosterone is a very, it's an analgesic hormone. Yeah. One well, of the reasons pain meds have rebound when you go off them is they rinse testosterone out of the body. They absolutely they decrease the ability of your hypothalamus to demand testosterone production. Um, the hypothalamus is kind of the driver in the brain of, of your glands. And, and that includes on men, the testes, which produce testosterone. And the hypothalamus becomes overridden with, uh, with opioids and unfortunately causes a decline in testosterone levels. So uh, men need to understand that they are having a reduced risk uh, when they're using testosterone versus increased risk. And so, and it, but if you still hear that, that lawyer on TV and you go, oh man, I need to stay off of that stuff. It's shocking how much misinformation rides the airways on hormones. Um, I was speaking about two months ago in Miami at the anti-aging conference and Dr. Abraham Morgan Toller was there. And he's an associate professor of urology and the president of the Urology Foundation. He's a urologist. He, this is his deal. And he put a, one of his first slides up and it said, almost everything that we have learned in med school about testosterone and prostate cancer is wrong. And he spent a big part of the early part of his talk showing how in 1941, the original guy that won the Nobel Prize showing the 
testosterone drove prostate cancer was based on three cases. He dove into those cases and showed how they were erroneous, even though this guy won a Nobel Prize. It's amazing how much myth and, and error can, can gain traction. So he showed how this was inaccurate, and then he started running studies, and he had patients that had prostate cancer that he tracked, and he gave all of this data, study after study, that he co-authored or head-authored in peer review, showing how his patients on testosterone with prostate cancer fared better, but he explained that there could be an early rise of the PSA just while the testosterone is normalizing things. So he took us through the science of tracking the PSA and not getting frightened by it, and it was just brilliant. I've been trying to get him on the show. He just retired, and I've been making an obnoxious um, person of myself with his secretary because I want him to get on the show. My best girlfriend's husband was on testosterone and developed prostate cancer, which, by the way, men on testosterone that get prostate cancer tend to get a much less aggressive kind. That's now very well replicated in the science. Mm -hmm. His urologist took him off testosterone replacement. And I was trying to get him a consult with Dr. Abraham Morenthaler to, to, you know, really give him some peace of mind. So there is this tremendous lag between the reality of the science and what patients are offered. There's another studies, a uh, group of studies that proved that uh, <clears throat> men who have had prostate cancer, and let's just, let's just say your doctor temporarily takes you off it while they do treatment on the prostate cancer. Okay. Um, once you go off of the treatment, and you go back on testosterone, the men who went back on testosterone had lower recurrence rates than the men who did not. And I think Abraham headed those studies. Absolutely. So, he was he was in on them. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, because he's one of the uh, um, authors of those studies. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. He's got a great book out on, on testosterone for men. But yeah. it, it's everybody would love to age slower and maintain their youth as long as they can. I mean, everyone would want to look better, think better, and hormones are the driving physiologic signaling molecules that allow you to do that. Why would nature make the very hormones that drive the procreation of homo sapiens cancer-causing? Why would nature do that? That makes no sense to me. I'm giving a talk in North Carolina in about two, three weeks showing the science. There's 21 studies where they've taken women with breast cancer, most of them ER positive, and given them estrogen right after they finished treatment for breast cancer. There's 21 studies, some of them at very prestigious cancer uh, institutions like Fred Hutchinson Research Cancer and MD Anderson, some from outside of the United States. So I put all these studies together. And when they track these women, they have less recurrence less death if they do get a recurrence and higher quality of life. In none of these studies did they see an increased risk of getting the cancer back or dying from the cancer if you get it back. And that's what I'm talking about in North Carolina in a few weeks. And these are all from prestigious institutions. They're not from somebody using a dowaging rod. 80% of, of breast cancer cases um, in women are actually in women who have never used hormones. 80%. Now, what does that tell you? And also, um, when you start looking at the cellular physiology um, and you hear about this ER uh, positive, you know, estrogen receptor positive, and all, when you see an ER positive cell, that's usually not the cell that is actually proliferating in breast cancer. And uh, Avram Blooming uh, was in on the study. Dr. Blooming uh, was in on the study on that, that, that showed that the cells that are reproducing are the ones that are not held in check with estrogen. So estrogen doesn't drive breast cancer, it actually inhibits it. And, uh, and so I thought that was amazing. I did not know that. And it, it gave me chill bumps when I, when I read that study because I thought, wow, this just, it's like prostate cancer and testosterone. It's just saying what you know is wrong or what you thought you knew was wrong. So after reading Dr. Blooming's book, where he says estrogen doesn't drive breast cancer, there's mammary stem cells, breast cancer stem cells that drive breast cancer, and they don't have re receptors for estrogen. They're not driven by estrogen. So I had met John Cazanellenbogen when I was a hormone scholar at Tulane, 
And John and Benita Casanel and Bogan are from the University of Illinois, and they've written most of the papers on ER profiling for breast cancer patients, taking Elwood Jensen's work, who I also met at Tulane. And so I called up John, and I, because John's written most of the papers on taking a look at breast cancer, ER positive profiles, or ER negative, et cetera. He's the dude. He's the dude with, with looking at estrogen receptors in breast cancer and his wife. And he said, boy, you know, that theory has been around a really long time that there are cells that drive breast cancer that aren't estrogen positive. And we, he said, there's so much conflict in information right now. We're even wondering if estrogen receptor beta really exists or it doesn't exist. He said, there's a, a lot of confusion right now in all of this. And he wrote me pa- he wrote me pages of paragraphs, some of which I still am trying to decipher. So the point is we don't understand everything, but the one thing that's becoming clearer and clearer is that estrogen doesn't drive most cases of breast cancer and testosterone doesn't drive most cases of, te- of prostate cancer. They're protective, but that information hasn't gotten down to the doctor that you go to see in the office when you say, am I a candidate for hormones? And Lindsay, what do you think about, you know, and one of the studies that you're going to be talking about in North Carolina um, was a study on, uh, and there, and there are several of them that are for women who are using hormones post breast cancer. So they, they had breast cancer, they got treated and they went back on hormones. And, and wasn't it interesting that the group that was on tamoxifen, which blocks estrogen from getting to the cell, were the group that had the highest recurrence rates? Right, Both right. Women, that's exactly right. Wasn't that shocking to you? I mean, because here we thought tamoxifen is a life-saving drug, and, and we know, in, in fact, it is not a life-saving drug. Um, and that and that the women who are not on tamoxifen had lower recurrence rates by as much as 20%. So there, understand that there's a lot of miscommunication on hormones, but then that becomes for the patient absolutely a confusing mire. Because then if, if you don't know who to trust and you can't go to your gynecologist and say, am I a candidate for hormones or not, then who do you go to? And how do you how do you figure out what's the right answer for you and what's safe? And how do you stay young but stay safe? And who's the person that's going to help you make those decisions? I have a, um, and just to help patients understand when doctors say something, they're saying things based on the standards of practice rather than on what they believe. Okay. So one of my oncologist buddies, um, and he's a, he's a wonderful man. Um, he treats tons of breast cancer cases. And so, and he's traditional, he's not, you know, bioidentical guy, but he, uh, he sends me cases all the time. And so I, I sent him this one lady who had breast cancer, got, he treated them. And, uh, now she went to him and she says, doc, I want to go back on hormones. And he says, well, um, I'm obliged to tell you that if you go back on hormones, you'll have an increased risk of recurrence of your breast cancer. And she said, but do you really believe that? And he said, no, I don't believe it, but I have to tell you that because the standards of practice for oncology say that I have to tell you that in spite of the fact that I don't believe it. So you know, this is the point. I think that standard of care was set up just for litigious reasons, that if a doctor isn't doing standard of care, you can sue him. So that means we have a standard of care. So if a doctor comes up with a more natural answer for you or a less expensive answer for you, but if it's not standard of care, which standard of care is driven by pharmaceutical companies, then they can be sued. So then it becomes where the doctor understandably doesn't want to lose their license. I mean, that's a huge fear, but then the patient is limited to standard of care when the answers might be outside of standard. Of and that's when, when I say, you know what, doc, and you, he calls me up and he says, Jim, I want to put this lady on hormones. What do you suggest? I want you to put her on the safest hormones that you think she should go on. And of course I put her on transdermal estrogen, meaning through the skin estrogen. I put her on oral progesterone, which seems to be a little more protective. And I put her on uh, transdermal testosterone, which uh, studies show decreases risk of uh, recurrence of breast cancer. So, so um, we got her on that. And, but I said, doc, it would be a good idea. Make her sign a waiver. You know, she's, she's already um, educated herself. 
She wants to live with better quality of life. And if even if the odds were just even, you know, in other words, no increased risk or decreased risk, she wants to have a better quality of life. She wants to have a sex life with her husband. She wants to be able to have a brain that can can navigate our society because she is foggy brained. Um, she's having hot flashes. She's not sleeping well. You know, she has aches and pains that she's never had. I said, Doc, you know, she all she wants is to feel better. And so you and I both agree that it's not going to increase her risks. And and so just have her sign a waiver to protect you from lawyers. Well, let me ask you this. I get a lot of women, let's say they are, they're 38 years old and they had a total hysterectomy a few years ago because they had a uterine sarcoma. Mm-hmm. And their doctor says you can never be on estrogen again. They're only in their 30s and they're starting to gain weight, not be able to think have anxiety, have joint pain, because hormones protect you against all those things. But the doctor says you can't do that or you have a risk of getting uterine cancer back again. Or the breast cancer patients who are fairly young and they've had, uh, they're on all these hormone blockers and told to be on them for years, but they're losing their life trying to never get that cancer back. And there, but standard of care is for them to be on the can, the estrogen blockers or to avoid estrogen, yet they can see their life dripping away. And their cancer doctor tells them, if you go on hormones, I'm sorry, I can't work with you again, or you're really at risk of losing your life. And then they're in this quandary. And then you say to them, I want you to know to work with me, you have to sign a waiver. Because what I'm recommending to you that I really believe is a good answer for you is against standard of care. So I want you to absolve me of any issue because you never know what's going to happen. And then they feel scared to death. Oh, my God, to work with this doctor, I'm supposed to sign a release. And it becomes a murky scenario. Um, But this is the reality that's happening more and more and more especially as we're living longer and longer, you don't want to live without hormones. If you had a hormonally driven cancer, they want you to never have hormones again. So women are frightened, understandably. They are. And it, and it's a barrier to their health. Uh, this, this fear is a barrier. And so, you know, that's when you have to use education, educate yourself, feel comfortable within your psyche that, that these hormones are the best thing for me. And then say, then you sign the waiver without a uh, quandary. You know, it's, it's okay to sign the waiver because you know that you've educated yourself. You've looked at the science. You talk to informed people like Lindsay Bergson <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and found out what the real story is, you know, because the truth matters. I matter of fact, I wrote a paper on that, you know, hormone uh, replacement therapy, safety and clinical utility, because the truth matters. That's fantastic. You know, I had breast cancer almost 30 years ago now, and people are always saying to me, how is it that you talk like this, act like this, go dancing last night? And I go, well, I've been on hormones now for 24, 25 years. I go back to my breast cancer surgeon every year because she has the most educated fingers and I don't want to get a mammogram every single year. So I have her go in and palpate my breasts. And every single time I see her over the last several decades. She says, you look better than any single breast cancer patient I have. You got to get off hormones. And I, I said, you're a surgeon. You don't know ditch shit about hormones. Excuse my language. And I said, and here she is about 20 years younger than me. And every year I come in, she's aging. Her eight, That's when you're not on hormones, your aging accelerates. When oh, you're on hormones, it slows it down. That is the fact. That is the fact. And um, I would not be who I am today without compounding pharmacists like yourself and without having access to hormones, although I'm also on 2-methoxyestradiol, which is a whole nother show. Thank you very much, Jim. You've been able to keep me on that. So hormones have, I've been ruined by hormones, the synthetic hormone my mother took in the womb that was shown to cause breast cancer in daughters born to those women. And I've been saved by hormones and compounding pharmacists. So it's been so great to have you on the show. We want to have compounding pharmacists, true healers have the rights to fulfill the prescriptions of doctors that have the rights to write the prescriptions for bioidentical hormones. So if people go to compounding.com, can they also go in and look at other people's testimonies if they go in there? You bet. So go in there and look at all those testimonies of other people who have decided to be that this makes sense 
This is scientific and it also makes common sense and they've been on them and they feel the positive results of them. So if you're feeling tired, brain fog, joint pain, just because you're older doesn't mean you should inevitably feel those things or suffer with those things. That's what we're talking about, our tools to really look at that smile on his face. He's 65 and he's pain free. How many people can say that? You want to be able to age as best as you can. And we believe that the ability of doctors to write scripts for you for bioidentical hormones, for compounding pharmacists to be able to soundly, safely, intelligently, scientifically fulfill those scripts is our American right. So please help us continue this good fight. And thank you for all that you have done for the community of Texas, Jim. You're just one of my heroes. And you are mine, of course. And by the way, metabolically, you are not a day over 45. I mean, metabolically, you know, metabolic aging versus uh, true aging, chronological, you're 45. And it's amazing. Hey, Jan, if you weren't married to him, you better watch out. (laughs) Thank you so much. This has just been incredible. You've given us some of your time on a Sunday afternoon. And take this to heart because everybody wants to feel better longer. And this is one of the answers, so don't miss out on it. And if you love these conversations, don't miss out on Smart Plus Heart, my group online that we are doing so many interactive things about giving you more tools in your tool bag. You can go to drlindsayberkson.com forward slash membership and just kind of look around and see if this might be something you want to hang out in. I, I forgot that Jim was one of those members already. So everybody, we want you to enjoy your life, not suffer through it. And we've seen with other people and ourselves that this is a possible answer. So just be open to a gift that is here and help us maintain this gift. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, bye, my dear friend. Bye-bye. Be well.